just ahead on Black Issues Forum. It's all about the HBCUs, their history, what they stand for, and their impact on our communities. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Kenya Thompson. HBCUs are a source of accomplishment and great pride for the African-American community, as well as the entire nation. The amended Higher Education Act of 1965 defines an HBCU as, quote, any historically black college or university that was established prior to 1964, whose principal mission was and is the education of black Americans. HBCUs offer all students, regardless of race, an opportunity to develop their skills and and talents. Right here in North Carolina, we are home to 11 of these historic institutions, with four of them being ranked in the top 15 across the nation. As a tribute to HBCU Week this week, we invite our guests to discuss their work in this space and its impact. Welcome to the show, HBCU Heroes co-founder George Lynch, along with Director of Programming for Creed, Camille Bostic. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. Of course. Well, I want to start off by, George, you telling us exactly what HBCU Heroes does and what your focus is for the nonprofit. Um, HBCU Heroes started when I was coaching at an HBCU, um, Clark Atlanta University down in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, the, 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 whole, the whole purpose was to level the playing field for student athletes at HBCUs. Um, we, we, we started the nonprofit, Tracy Pennywell and I, right around COVID, right after COVID hit. And uh, the sole purpose was to support students who wanted to attend HBCUs financially, support them with the uh, uh, admissions. And then we carried over into, you know, uh, what a student from an HBCU would like to do career-wise after they graduate, uh, you know, we, we talk to so many students and a lot of them say that, you know, Fortune 500 companies don't come to their HBCU. And a lot of that's because most of the HBCUs are hard to get into. They mostly located in the Southeast and very small rural areas. So for, for uh, a corporation or a recruiter to, to travel into one of those small towns, it's, it's a little bit challenging. Not an excuse, but sometimes are challenging to fit the schedule in. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, Camille, I want to come to you, an overview of what you do for Creed and how that connects with HBCU Heroes. Absolutely. So I am the Director of Programming at the Center for Racial Equity in Education, or Creed, and we are a North Carolina-based nonprofit with the, the goal to make sure that the educational outcomes of students of color are improved in this state and we're here to make sure that we push for equity lenses, whether that's pre-K all the way through the postgraduate uh, situation in education. And so about uh, two years ago, Cree was really looking at the educational landscape and we began looking at how North Carolina is home, as you mentioned, to uh, 11 HBCUs, 10 of which are fully accredited four-year institutions. And it's how do we make sure that those institutions who have been around for so long uh, are actually getting and thriving and doing what they need. So we went on the listening tour in um, April of last year through August. We visited all 10 of the four-year institutions, listened to really what was happening there, talk with them, we have built with them a collaborative. Uh, we're more of like a, a strategy partner. Uh, and uh, as part of that, we are listening, working with the NC10 itself to make sure that they get their needs met and their ideas out there. And we are uh, 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 helping them put their voice out there for what they want and need as institutions in the 21st century. Mm. Now, many aren't quite aware of what those differences are between HBCU experiences and other schools. Myself, for example, I went to a very small private college here in the Triangle. Um, I'd love to hear from both of you. What does that experience look like, George? You know, when someone talks about that HBCU experience, what is that like? Um, for me, uh, I didn't go to, a, to an HBCU, but, but worked at an HBCU for a few years and now being involved with HBC Heroes, uh, 
This, most HBCUs probably is about 35 to 4,000 students, 4,500 maybe at the max. So you get that one-on-one, -on -one, you get that personal uh, uh, contact and relationship with the teachers where that they can, uh, they really get to know your name. Uh, you know, I went to Chapel Hill where it was anywhere from 300 students in a classroom other than me being six, eight, six, eight and tall, being on the basketball team, professors don't really know who you are. Um, but um, in, a, in a smaller setting like an HBCU campus, you really get to the relationships and the, in the sense of family, the, a lot because of the, the small nature of the campus. Yeah. Camille, was your experience undergrad or graduate on an HBCU campus? Neither, actually, but I too also taught at HBCU and in the conversations that I've had with so many folks who are there as students, alumni, they, they, they actually talk about what George spoke of, of this feeling of being at home, of not having to uh, not be yourself, where people not only know your name, but they know your story and they care and you don't have to feel like you are an outsider. It's definitely a culture of caring and a spirit of I'm here and I can bring my whole self to it. And you can tell on like homecoming, of course, but you definitely can feel it every day when you walk on those campuses, just the, the close-knit nature of it all. Yeah, I recall, because I was down the street from about two or three uh, HBCUs and I would always kind of sneak over to campus just to see what that experience was like. And it was a world of difference. And I always thought, well, why didn't I go here? Um, but you know, some of the things that I would hear my peers talk about was the educational difference or the needs that they needed. Um, so, Camille, I'd love to hear, what are some of the most overlooked needs among HBCUs? I think what we found in listening and talking continuously with the, the 10 HBCUs, the four-year HBCUs in North Carolina, is that there is the need to have more investment in infrastructure and uh, the things about the actual buildings that are on campus. Uh, there's the need to really think about the funding and how it will be funded. Uh, HBCUs are historically, currently, whether they are private or public. And then also just the need to understand like their, their impact and all of the things that actually they, they need to support their students and make sure that their students are thriving um, as, as scholars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And part of that impact that you talked about, um, I think, is in the programs, right? What the students actually go through. George, I know that HBCU Heroes raises money for some of these on-campus programs. What types of programs do you guys support or raise money for? And what, what types of students do they produce when we're actually investing into these programs? Um, well, we're young. Uh, we're a young nonprofit, you know, about four years into it. So we, a lot of the research on what the students have done um, after the program hadn't been gathered. Um, but we do bring corporations like Amazon, um, MAI Capital Financial Institutions to the campuses, tech corporations uh, to different campuses so that the students get to meet them personally. A lot of times this is friendships, people we know and have um, form a partnership with HBC Heroes. So we're able to bring them to campus and actively get involved and sit down and look at the resumes of some of these bright students that come out of HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And when when we when you students have the opportunity to do that, do you see a change? I, I know that whenever I would have the opportunity to sit in front of an employer, to sit in front of a, a, an opportunity, going to a small college that afforded me that too. Um, what do you see as far as the, the inspiration and the hope that you find in the children when, when we're starting to really invest back into our students? I think it's, you get a self, they, get, they have a self uh, awareness of their confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, someone really cares about them, uh, took the time to come in and speak to them. Um, you know, we, we at HBC Heroes try to take away all barriers. Um, we want students to be comfortable in what they wear when they come talk to these corporations. So it's really not a, a, a dress up affair, just come as you are. Uh, we don't want any of those barriers keeping students from uh, being able to attend. Mm -hmm. And we've had our most success by going to the campuses um, this past Final Four in New Orleans, we were able to get David, uh, Xavier Dillard and UNO, Southern UNO, um, to the campus of Dillis because of the proximity of both camp, all three campuses being close and in New Orleans. So 
Uh, that was a great experience. The, the students loved it. Uh, they got to go behind the scenes and see how um, Final Fours were produced. Um, one of the brothers in TNT um, sat down with some of their top execs uh, to talk to students about being in that industry. And it was, a, it was an all around great experience for both myself, HBCU Hero co-founder and, uh, and the students who, who attended. Yeah. Now, I know historically in the past, uh, some numbers have been kind of skewed, right? Going down and going up as far as enrollment goes. Camille, I know that HBCUs compete with a lot of the local state universities and now even community colleges. Um, what have we seen in enrollment numbers, if, there's, if that's something that you could speak to? Is there a decline in the um, enthusiasm of in, uh, attending an HBCU? Actually, I think over the, the past few years, HBCUs have been experiencing a renaissance of sorts. They've never actually gone like out of favor, though you were seeing that competition for students once uh, the historically, well, predominantly white colleges and others were, you know, accepting black students. They, they talk about how it was sort of, um, you know, a, a, a creaming off of, of the best, of the best. And so, but that's really turned lately after the pandemic, thinking about uh, things that have happened you know, post the George Floyd protest, a lot of students are choosing and have been choosing HBCUs for the fact of not being had, not having to be in institutions that don't see them, that don't understand what it means to be a black student in America at this point and having to always justify their existence. So uh, Forbes put out an article recently just about that resurgence of what's happening with HBCUs in terms of enrollment. And I think all of our uh, NC10 colleges are reporting uh, increased enrollment uh, for the last few years. So I think it's been very uh, interesting to kind of watch what we thought was the, the narrative around who's choosing an HBCU and actually what's happening in the last few years over what we're seeing students do. And the students are very vocal about the idea that they are choosing their HBCUs because they want places of affirmation and excellence. And HBCUs are delivering, especially the ones in North Carolina, for that. Right. Uh, and I think that's great. And I think the opportunity there is in strengthening in partnerships in our community. Right. And so when we talk about the importance of these schools partnering with not just employers, but local community uh, nonprofits, other businesses, George, how does that really help with sustaining um, some of these programs at the school? Um. It's, it's definitely, we, we spoke on it earlier, a lot of HBCUs as far as um, admissions, applications, um, you know, corporations investing back in HBCUs. It hadn't been where it should be um, compared to some of the PWIs. So anytime we're able to bring awareness to it, um, uh, uh, share the light of the bright students that come out of HBCUs uh, and then help corporations with their DEI uh, initiatives, uh, I think it helps in both ways. Uh, you know, students from HBCUs can 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 show how bright and brilliant they are, and corporations can can build that relationship, that bridge where they continue to go into HBCUs and find the brightest of the bright students. Uh -huh. And you know, part of finding the brightest of the bright is also allowing our students to be competitive when we go out in this workforce. Camille, I know you deal with racial equity. How does that translate into the actual curriculum, um, the uh, majors that our HBCUs are, are offering to our students? One of the things that we're, we've been noticing in the, in the North Carolina HBCU say that they are doing is that they are making sure their graduates are competitive and ready to take their place uh, in this, you know, global economy. So you're seeing a lot of new programming. I think uh, there's an esports program cre getting created at Livingstone. We hear about aviation at Elizabeth City State. You can think about cybersecurity. I think um, a lot of the HBCUs are really pushing themselves forward in terms of what they're offering students so they can be competitive, but also making sure that the, the students who are going there, the black students actually have that access to make sure that they're ready for the careers of the future. And you mentioned partnership. I think it's very important that um, a lot of the companies really understand the talent that has been at HBCUs. They've been 
at the forefront of creating social mobility and making sure that Black students and Black scholars and graduates are out there. They've produced many of the STEM graduates that we see and are, you know, beacons of social mobility, but getting those connections to say, like, once a student has matriculated through one of the NC-10, is there a job waiting because those companies in North Carolina and beyond are really ready to kind of tap into that talent? Mm -hmm. there, there's some gaps there that need to really continue to get built um, but I think the HBCUs are up for the challenge and the students are definitely there. So it's just a matter of people kind of meeting in the middle and saying we're ready to, to, to do what we need to do because it's happening. And the students and the programs exist um, and, and they're getting ready every single day for the next step. Yeah. And it's good to hear, right, that they're, the schools are being cognizant about what's needed. How do we keep our students competitive? Because that's one of the major issues, I think, when we when we try to market ourselves with an HBCU on our resume, you know, people are going to ask, well, how does this compare to NC State or another state school? And so, you know, we want to say it compares just as equally. And, and, and I think that having those competitive programs are one of the major ways to be able to do that. Now, when we talk about affordability, and um, financial assistance for our students. George, are we finding that we're able to provide scholarships for our students so that they can take advantage of some of these programs and education that's out there? Yeah, that's, that's been the challenge. You hear a lot of the, the, the brighter students who want to attend an HBCU doesn't have the opportunity because maybe Georgia Tech will offer more money or, you know, Duke or the PWIs who have the endowments. Uh, you know, the, the challenge for, for us is the economic mobility. Our, our people of color having the same opportunities to work at these corporates where they have incomes to either give back to an HBCU. Uh, but anyone, that's why we started HBCU rules. Anyone can give back to an HBCU. If you're a person of color and you have five or ten dollars, just, uh, you know, assign it to any HBCU. Uh, you know, that's the difference between PWIs and HBCUs, I think, is PWIs have more alumni that is willing to give back and uh, where the HBCUs have alumni, but the numbers are a little skewed to per compared to what they can give back and how many is given back. Yeah, I think there's a distinction there, what they want to give back versus what they can. And, you know, that goes back again to providing that quality programming so that they can go out and compete. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know, but are there are we seeing a rising number of entrepreneurship from HBCU colleges? And, and what does that mean for the future of, you know, our business landscape and, and black ownership of business? Either one. Go ahead, you can take it. I don't have, I don't have like recent numbers on entrepreneurship, but I do think uh, the legacy of HBCUs has always been that they have provided educational opportunity in spaces where it would have, be, would have been denied otherwise. Like the predominantly white institutions are predominantly white because they've been historically white. We know that there have been barriers to Blacks getting educated in the United States, and HBCUs have filled that gap since 1865 and, and beyond, right? Um, and so I think there's the legacy that is Black entrepreneurship largely comes because there has been HBCUs who are not only, you know, building the scholars, but building the networks and the communities of networks that exist. So I am thoughtful and hopeful, and I know that it's continuing. I hear a lot of students saying that they want to create the next thing um, that they're being trained for. They're not all looking to just be, you know, a cog in somebody else's corporate workforce. I do want to, you know, take it back just a, a quick moment to, to giving and the need for scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about alumni from HBCUs is because, you know, you know, racism in America is that a lot of times when you are a graduate, you're not always given the capacity to earn, make your full earning potential for so many different barriers that happen um, with the, the corporates and how they hire and who they choose to feel like are qualified. And so I think our HBCU alumni want to give, but just given the factor that, you know, black the black wealth gap exists, that they're not able to give at levels that match what happens to, uh, let's say, at those graduates of the PWI level. So I think at some point, we have to have that reckoning of what's happening systemically that's affecting the HBCU alumni base and what can happen 
if we were to strengthen that and make sure we remove barriers for graduates. Lastly, just for the terms of scholarship, I hear a lot of students say that they are, would love to continue at HBCU or any institution, but because college affordability is such an issue, mm -hmm. and when we look at um, really like the, the black student debt that exists, we need folks to invest in students. They want to and they can achieve academically, but there's just so much uh, price difference in what they can do when they have to deal with their families and trying to make sure you can't work a 40 hour a week job and also be a full time student. But many of our students are trying to do that because this is what, you know, our, our economic system has essentially left for them. So if we can give, let's give and make sure we're supporting the student. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I've noticed also the diversity of student uh, enrollment and population now at HBCUs. So are we seeing more non-minority students enrolling? Um, Camille, I'll come back to you for that question. I think maybe the, the figure is about 24% of the enrollment in HBCUs in North Carolina is non-students um, of color because they are providing wonderful opportunities for all students. Uh, the stu black students, of course, are going to feel affirmed. They're going to have that history and that legacy of being like, we accept you holistically on our campus. But the programs are excellent. And one of the things that we're really striving for with the NC10 work is to make sure people understand just how much the, the institutions are wonderful spaces providing quality education to so many students from all walks of life, black universities and colleges are up for the task and there are many people who are not black students who are saying I want a piece of that and actually be very thoughtful and happy about it once yeah. they've done. Yeah and I think it's you know it's, a, it's flattering. Great story. Go I, have ahead. A, I have a great story on that. Um, I was sitting in um, Sutton's diner uh, the weekend of the family and UNC Chapel Hill game and a judge came in and he attended Chapel Hill mm -hmm. and uh, he sat down and was talking to us and he was telling us um, the only reason that he is a judge because he was able to go to North Carolina Central. Oh. You know, he I didn't he didn't say he didn't didn't he applied to UNC or Duke Law School, one of the bigger PWIs, and didn't get in. He said the reason why he's a judge uh, because Central gave him an opportunity to go to law school. So that was that that shows you that people of uh, of different race and backgrounds. Uh, attend HBCUs. Yeah. And I think, you know, and the we need we, one more thing. We need more we need more men <laughs> to apply to HBCUs. They're they're giving out a lot of scholarships for men who's academically eligible to attend college. Mm, well, I hope our viewers are listening to that. And that's an interesting statistic that we do. You know, I think a lot of women go to school. I think the numbers are a little skewed, right? But if that's a good knowledge to have to know that there's scholarship, there's money out there, there's a desire to see our men um, at these on these campuses. So that's good to know. George, I know that HBCU Heroes is joining forces with UNC Chapel Hill to host HBCU celebration game Career Fest. Um, it, during this fest, you're going to pair with job seekers with companies uh, seeking to boost DEI metrics. And and so I, I kind of wanted to talk about why is this important and are those DEI metrics just to check a box or or are we really um, requiring our folks to be intentional about this? We're, we're hoping uh, companies are being intentional and, and have, a, have a directive of, you know, trying to close that economic gap. Um, you know, so much money is made off of black and brown people, uh, you know, throughout the years in America. And, but we haven't been able to give the same, we haven't been given the same opportunities um, work-wise. So being able to bring PWIs like North Carolina, who's basically probably four schools for the North Carolina HBCUs within 30, 30 minutes um, from Chapel Hill, to bring those um, groups together on campus, uh, it just feeds that, that bridge, building that bridge and that community uh, together faster than, you know, trying to do it alone. I think it's a great effort, and, and I really do hope that the intention is true from these companies that are seeking to boost their metrics. You know, I think we talk about DEI, it's a buzzword, it's a buzz term, um, but, you know, it's really important to actually do the work behind creating these spaces for our black and brown students to infiltrate into some of these companies. Um, Camille, do you have anything that you could add about that dealing with racial equity? 
I think you're spot on the idea that um, it can seem a little transactional sometimes to just say, well, we'll, we'll connect with you on the other side. A lot of the HBCUs are asking for things like, what's the, the pipeline looking like? Can we get internships? Can we make sure that our students are able, once they leave, to go into companies that respect them and understand them and aren't going to you know, isolate them? And so I think the conversations have definitely started. The uh, intentionality is there, but we want to see it happen more so that the students themselves are getting that opportunity and they can feel welcome from the start and not like they are the afterthought or like you mentioned, the box to check. But Mm -hmm. definitely from what I'm hearing from a lot of the partners that I've been hearing uh, are talking to our NC10 um, institutions, there are are lots of good traction toward making sure that um, graduates of HBCUs are going into those corporate spaces and those organizations beyond that are ready for them and and open arms for them. Wonderful. Uh, George, I want to leave you uh, with the last words here. Um, Share with people how they can donate or how they can be part of HBCU Heroes if they would like to. Yes, anyone that would like to donate, um, we're on um, all the social media threads, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And we have a link, donate at hbcus.org. And we'll Uh, flash it on the screen for our viewers as well. But I just want to thank you both for being here with us today, uh, George Lynch and Camille Bostic. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank today's guests for joining us. We invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Kenya Thompson. Thanks for watching. through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.